I learned a long time ago, God taught me, Mike, don't try to move your people. When I'm ready, I'll move them. When I'm ready, I'll create things in them. When I'm ready, I'll do it. And I'll do it my way, and it'll be everlasting. If I were the kind of pastor that would make you do things, it would last a little while. But if God puts it in your heart to do, you'll do it from this day to the rest of your life, and you'll never stop. And that's just the wisdom. I'm glad to see God moving. I really am. And I see God moving in many ways in this church. And I appreciate, John, your testimony, your openness, your honesty. And uh, again, brother, no offense is on our part. Okay? God moves me, and I do. And it's a joy to do it. And at some point, God will move each one of you in whatever way he's going to do it. God's going to move you, and God's going to work in you. And it actually has a lot to do with what I'm going to say. Take your Bible, turn to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2. That is a, a chapter, that, it's a place in the Bible. It's going to take you a little while to find it. And if it does, then you need to practice more. Right? Who knows the books of the Old Testament by heart? Raise your hand. I know you do because you were in my office saying them a while ago. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Well, I'll, get, I'll go to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So it's almost to Matthew. You find Matthew, go back a few pages. You'll be in Haggai. Okay? Now, last Sunday morning, I preached on rebuilding. Rebuilding. And I got to thinking about that this week, and, and God had, had been laying this on my heart all week. And uh, it's something I'd seen in the Bible years ago, and uh, I don't think I share it very often. I, the, the idea is there, but I don't, I don't talk about it very often, but it just seemed to fit today. And uh, when I got home, I was real tired last night, and it was easy to put together. So that's two reasons why I'm going to preach this today. Number one, it's good, and it'll fit with what's going on, fit with what I preached last, and, and, and number two, it's real easy. So, anyway, but hopefully God will, God will bless you with it and God will help you with it. Haggai chapter 2, verse 5. Are you there? Say amen. Look up on the screen. It ain't there. I didn't bring the... I think the projector is still out in the van somewhere. I didn't bring it in. So, anyway, you're going to have to turn in your Bible. We're going to be turning in several places. So, get your Bibles out and get them ready. And read along with me. If you didn't bring a Bible today, there should be one right there in the pew there in front of you. Hopefully, we got enough Bibles to go around. And they're all the same Bible. They're going to say the exact same thing. And so we're going to read the word of God this morning. We're going to believe it and believe what God said. Haggai chapter 2 verse 5. The Bible says, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. God's not dead. Amen. God's not dead and God's promises are not failing. They're still alive. If he made a promise to you, God intends to keep that promise. And uh, he's always going to keep that promise. Verse 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Now I want you to think about that. Has God, I could preach a message this morning, has God ever shaken you? If he shakes you, you know it. There's no, dis there's no disguising God shaking. If God shakes you, you know it. And what he does, he's shaking off things that don't belong there anymore. And he's leaving room for the things that he's going to put in place. Verse 7, And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. Guess who that desire is? There is in the heart, this is what I believe, there is in the heart of every man a desire to know God. A desire to know God. Now that desire gets thwarted, or that desire gets put off in different directions, or put in different places by different things. We know the devil's deceiver and all that stuff. And people die very lonely and they die a very uh, wasted life because they have never met the, the true desire of their life. Let me tell you something. The true desire of your life is not really your wife or your husband. The true desire of your life is not having more money. The true desire of your life is not having more women or more men in your life. The true desire of your life is not having more alcohol, more drugs, and more cigarettes, and more tobacco, and more puffing, and everything else. The true desire of your life is not to have a bigger buffet. 
the true desire of your life, it can only be met by one thing, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, His presence in your life. And I promise you, once you get there, you'll always be satisfied. You'll never be without it. Somebody say amen. The desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, said the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, said the Lord of hosts. Now, this was written and given to Haggai the prophet at a time. Israel, like we preached out of Nehemiah last week. And when Nehemiah and those folks came back from being in Babylon 70 years, they found out that the house of the Lord had been completely destroyed, and the wall had been torn down, and they were there to rebuild. So now, at this time, they're considering putting that, and I think they're going to lay the foundation of the Lord's house, and they're going to try to rebuild that temple. To them, that was it. That was their religion. That was the central part of what, of what they did. They needed the house of God. Listen, you listen to your preacher this morning. You need the house of God present in your life. How many of y'all know that? You need it. We need to be, I need to be here, amen. I didn't feel like coming. I, you, listen, I fought the devil all morning this morning. I don't want to go to church. I just, I was mad because I had to come and go to work. I'm not mad anymore, by the way. But I need to be here. So they needed the house of God. And they realized it. So they're going to lay the foundation. And here's what God said. God made a promise to them. Now you listen to this. You listen to God's word today. Verse 9. Look at your Bible. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, look at your Bible. He said that twice, saith the Lord of hosts, saith the Lord of hosts. What does he mean by that? Well, one of the things he means is, if I said it, I'm going to do it. If I said it, I am going to do it. Hell can't stop me. You can't bypass it. I will put peace in this place. And I promise you, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. Let me take you back just a few minutes. Solomon spent, the Bible says he spent seven years building the house of the Lord. He built the temple in Jerusalem. It was absolutely stunning what he had put in there. They brought cedars from Lebanon. They, bought, they brought the best architects down from Tyre. They brought the silver. They brought gold. They brought embroidered works. When Solomon dedicated that house, they, the priest took the Ark of the Covenant and they set it in the most holy place. And God showed up in there and the glory filled the house so much that not even the Levite priest could stand in the presence of God being in that house. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't it be something? If we came to church one Sunday and the glory of God filled this place so much we had to walk out of here and leave and say we cannot even be in there. We're so rotten and sinful. We cannot be in the presence of God. Now you listen to me. God swore. He said if you, some of you old timers, you heard the stories. You know, you know what was written in the, in the records of the Chronicles and the Kings. You know what, that, what my glory did in that house when it was first built. He said I'm promising you the glory of this second house is going to be greater than that, than that one there. It's going to be far better when we do this the second time. Now I'm going to give you a little history lesson. And I'm going to tell you what this means. When they built this second temple. Did you know that they did not have the table of showbread. Where the twelve loaves were that went into the sanctuary. That was missing. Sometime between the time they left Jerusalem in 70 years of Babylonian captivity, that table went missing. And that table represented Jesus Christ. He's the bread from heaven. That, and that goes all the way back to what Moses built in the tabernacle. Also, there was supposed to be seven candlesticks, a lampstand with seven candlesticks on it, seven, seven lamps that Moses himself built that was in the tabernacle, that was in the temple of Solomon, that also was missing. That candlestick represented the seven spirits of God that was going to dwell in that house. It was missing. Somehow during 70 years they lost it. Nobody knows where it is. To this day nobody knows where it is. Also missing, the most important piece of furniture 
in that house would have been the Ark of the Covenant because once a year the high priest had to go in and sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat seven times to atone for the people of Israel. That was required in the law. The Ark of the Covenant went missing sometime after the days of Josiah the king. And to this day, nobody knows where they are. So they built this grand temple and had zero furniture in it. Nothing in it that represented who their God was to them. He was the bread from heaven. He was the light. And He was the glory of the Lord. He was the mercy of God. All of that was missing. So they built it. And God never showed it. Guess what He meant? You. You. The glory of this latter temple shall be far greater than the glory of this first temple. Do you believe God? Say amen. Amen. Now, take your Bible. Turn to Exodus chapter 4. In fact, no, 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 no. Hold up. Hold, hold, hold. Hebrews 8. Turn there. Turn there. Hebrews 8. That temple that they built lasted all the way to the time of Jesus. And you remember what Jesus... When they showed Jesus that temple, they said, Look here, Lord. Isn't this beautiful? We built that. Jesus said, destroy this temple. And, and they said, oh, no, 40 and 6 years were we building in this temple. And he said, no, destroy this temple. In three days, I'll rebuild it. And they didn't understand that he spoke of the temple of what? His body. Okay? Listen. The house does not impress our Lord. You haven't seen his. Amen? Uh, Hebrews chapter 8. Why did I have you turn there? Watch this. Verse 1. Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary. Now watch this. Look at your Bible now. Verse 2. Of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. You see, man built that second temple. Man built the tabernacle in the wilderness. Man built Solomon's temple, which was the second dwelling place. Man built what they called Herod's temple, which was the place that was the, at the time of Jesus. And it got destroyed in A.D. 70. And where it was is nothing but a bare rock right now, except the Dome of the Rock Mosque in Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock Muslim Mosque is sitting right where the temple would have sat, should sit, and God said... I'm not even meaning that one either. There's one more coming. There's one more house that's going to be built on this earth. And Jesus himself is going to build it. Jesus was raised by who? Who was Jesus raised by? Joseph. What was Joseph's trade? You think that was an accident? Do you think God said, oh, wow, that worked out pretty good, didn't it? No, 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 no. When our Lord builds the house, the glory of it is far greater than anything you could have ever imagined. And it is better when He does it. Heavenly Father, my body is so tired, I'm weary. But Lord, I love this church and I love these people. Lord, they're worth it to me. Every bit, Lord, every drop I've got, they're worth it. Lord, they're on a long journey through life. And God, they've had their house destroyed. They have no idea what to do. And Lord, you've taught me this. You've taught it to me in real life. You've taught it to me in, in picture and in typology and doctrine. You've taught it to me. Lord, I see it all in the Bible. I love it. Lord, just help me give it to them now. They, they need that hope. They need, God, they need that hope. Father, we get so stuck on how we like things and how we want it to be and how we, how we think we need it to be for our comfort, for our happiness. God, we, we get so stuck in that. And Father, we have no, we have no idea how much better you have for us is Far above better, Lord, than anything that we've ever had. 
And Lord, forgive us for clinging to the old. Forgive us for that. Forgive us for clinging, Lord, to that which satisfieth not. That which taught our happiness. God, forgive us for that. Because it's all we know. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that in somebody's life today, somebody this week, somebody, Lord, maybe this year, Lord, I don't care when you do it, because I've learned, Father, that when you do it, it's right, and it's good, and it lasts, and it's, it's beautiful. God, teach glory of the latter house that you have prepared for them, that you yourself will build. It's far greater than anything they could have ever imagined. Father, bless your word today. Lord, help me to preach it. Father, may you be praised in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Now, turn to Exodus chapter 4. There's a picture of this. Beautiful picture of this. God taught me this years ago. And I read it one time. I just wept and I, I shouted to the Lord and I had a good time with him. And, and I, just liked, I just like understanding mysteries is what I like. I like seeing uh, types and shadows and metaphors and allegories and symbols in the Bible. Man, I love seeing that stuff and understanding what it means from the rest of the Bible. And that just that's where I get my kicks and thrills and everything else. I guess God just has to design you that way. I don't know, but... Anyway, I never pulled a wheelie on a motorcycle, so I don't know if that's a thrill or not. I saw my dad flip off backwards one time doing that, and I decided that wasn't for me. Okay, so I don't know if that's thrilling or not, but I just like seeing stuff in the Bible and going, I get that, I know what that means. In Exodus chapter 4, and I want you to look at your Bible. I don't know if you've ever read this before, but did you ever wonder? Did you ever wonder? This is Moses, he's standing in front of the burning bush, and God is going to put his calling on his life. Moses is not guessing how old Moses is at this time. Now, you listen to me. Us, us old folk, listen. I'm not getting younger. I'm getting older, and I feel it in my bones every day. And I'm going to tell you something. You're not done. God's not done with you. He's not, you're not all you washed up. You've got a place in the kingdom of God. Can I, tell you, can I tell you about a guy named Harlan? I want, to tell you about a, I want to tell you the story of a man by the name of Harlan. Harlan grew up poor. Harlan grew up, he always wanted to be better off than what he was. And he had a rough life and he was taught age to cuss. And I mean he cussed, he cursed, he swore. There wasn't a word that he didn't use and he used them often. He would use them in front of his wife. He would use them in front of his children, in front of anybody's children. He'd be back in the kitchen of his restaurant, and you could hear him back there just swearing and cursing, and when things didn't go right, I mean, he would just let out a curse and a swear and everything else. And I mean, that was just his life. And he got, he tried different things. He tried, uh, he tried different trades that he tried in life, and they, they didn't work so well with him. He tried to run for Congress one time, and that didn't work so well with him. And I mean, he just, he just kept trying, he kept trying, he kept trying. Finally, when Harlan was in his sixth, he had a little roadhouse there in Kentucky. And he was working on a chicken recipe. Best chicken in the world. You figure out who I'm talking about now? Harlan Sanders. Harlan Sanders, in his 60s, was working on this chicken recipe and took off. And a man by the name of uh, Dave... Who's the guy that owns Wendy's? Dave Thomas approached Harlan Sanders and said, I want to franchise these restaurants. You're going to get like eight cents out of every chicken that we sell until the day you die. And Harlan Sanders made that deal with him. But Harlan Sanders, even before he met the Lord, Harlan Sanders told God, he said, God, if you will make this thing work, I promise whatever money I get, I'll give to whoever needs that money. I'll help people out. And he said, God, would you just help me? After Colonel Sanders sold off his chicken business, Kentucky Chicken. This man now is in his 70s and 80s. He's, he is old man. He is over and above 80 years old. And God laid it on his heart to go to this little church in the area that he lived in. And God had told those people that God was going to send somebody with wealth to help that church out. And those two people met at a revival service. And Harlan Sanders got on his knees before the Lord and asked Jesus into his heart. And God saved him at 80 some odd years old. And he testified. He said, you look this up on YouTube. See if I'm not telling you the truth. He got on TV and testified. He said, when God saved me, he cleaned my mouth up. He said, I used to curse and to swear. And he said, I was awful at what I listened to outtakes. 
There on the, on the internet, there are outtakes of commercials that Harlan Sanders did that they bleeped and bleeped and bleeped. He used to swear. When things didn't go right, he would curse and swear and make a mess of it. And he said, when God saved me, he cleaned my life. And he said, I don't swear no more. I don't curse no more. He said, when I say the name of Jesus, I say it in some respect because Jesus is my Lord. The man died, went to heaven. You are not too old. You're not too washed up. You're not too give up. Don't you dare give up on life. Somebody say amen. That Moses, standing at the burning bush, he's 80 years old. Do you not understand that? He's past retirement. He's already had, he's had some children. He's a, he's a, a very wealthy man. He's got, he's got cattle everywhere. And God brings him to the burning bush and he says, I'm not done with you. I got 40 more years out of you, Moses. And I'm going to get every drop. The Bible says when Moses died at 120 years old, God preached his funeral there on the mountain and God buried him. And the Bible said that when Moses died, his whole life force was in him. Wasn't even sick. He didn't have diabetes, John. Amen. It's probably because he, he ate what God told him to eat. Amen. Now I want you to look at Exodus chapter 4 verse 6. I've got, I've got more of this this morning than i got the time or the strength or the wood out. But I'm going to give you something this morning that, that hopefully will change your life. If you let God rebuild it, I promise you, I promise you, I'm telling you, thus saith the Lord, if you let God rebuild it, it'll be better than anything you could have ever thought of or imagined if you God do it. So what are you talking about, Mike? I'm talking about broken homes. I'm talking about broken marriages. I'm talking about broken relationships with family members. I'm talking about a nation that is going to hell. I'm talking about a nation that spits in God's face and sodomizes everybody. And there's adultery and fornication and lasciviousness in our country. It's handed down to our children. Our children are becoming sexed up at 8, 9, 10 years old. It is a disgusting country. And God can tear this place apart and rebuild it. That's what I believe in. It's not going to be man that does it. It's not Donald Trump that does it. It wasn't Barack Obama and it wouldn't have been hit either. It'll have to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You can tell I've been hearing listening to preachers preach all week. Amen. Amen. Verse 6, the Lord said furthermore unto him, but Moses, you know what Moses did? He offered an excuse to God. You listen to me. He offered an excuse to God, didn't, didn't he? But, 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 but God, I, 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 st I st stammer, you, you, you can't, you can't, can't, can't send me. Listen, I know an old man, I just talked to him, he prayed with me yesterday, I didn't feel good. He came in, Mike, he said, I'm going to pray with you. Three years old, he is a preacher, one of the best I've ever known, one a godly man. Always, always going about trying to raise people's awareness about what's going on in this country. The man stutters. And God called him to preach. What was your excuse? What excuse did you... What did you tell God that you could not do? How dare you? How dare you tell God what you cannot do? I did it. I did it. I told God I couldn't do it. Leave me alone. Go get somebody else. God's not sorry he calls you. The gifts and the callings of God are always without his repentance. Always. So, he's telling Moses, Moses, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you something, Moses. He said, I promise you, Moses, they'll listen. The Lord said furthermore unto him, put now thine hand into thy bosom. And so he put his hand into his bosom. Watch, everybody look up here. This is what he does. You know where your bosom is, don't you? Okay? So he puts his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, God, God said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again. And plucked it out of his bosom, it was turned again as his other flesh. You see that? And this, look at verse 8, look at what God said. And it shall come to pass, Moses, listen to me now. Moses, listen to me. If they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, 
that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Watch this. Now, here's the first sign. Put your, hand, put your hand in your bosom, Moses. He put his hand, pulled it out. The first time had leprosy. The leprosy was so thick that his hand was scaled over like snow. Looked like snow on his hand. Instantaneously. He said, now Moses, that's the first sign. Now show him the second sign. Clean. What did God do for you? Turn in your Bible, in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 1. Let me tell you about this hand. Is your hand bothering you, Lynn? I can see it. Let me tell you about your hand. Your hand, God designed it. You did not, your hand did not come from a monkey's hand. Your hand did not come from a, from a pile of slime in a pool 150,000 million years ago. Your hand was crafted by a designer. It was by God himself who shaped and fashioned and used the bones and the skin and the blood of your hand. Even, even the etchings and the carvings in your hand, God put them there. Did you know that in Isaiah, God told Israel, Israel was scared that God would forget them. And God said, how can I forget you? He said, behold, when you on the palms of my hands, thy gates are ever before me. And I looked at that one day and I started looking at my hand and I thought, you know, I, I know when you go to a palm reader, they'll say, look, oh, look at this mark here. Oh, this mark here says this. And this mark here says that. They're lying through their teeth. They're making that stuff up. That's of the devil. Don't believe that stuff. God said, I've graven you in the palm of my hands. Thy gates are, and I, that, and I went, oh, it occurred to me what it was. Everybody do this. Everybody do this. Hold your hand out at it like this. You folks at home, do it. I'll know it. Look at these four fingers here. You have, this is how you, see you bend your fingers like that, and there's just carvings in your fingers. Each finger, each and four, there are three sections. In Revelation, John said he saw New Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And Jerusalem had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 gates in its four walls. And the name of a tribe of Israel of each of those four gates. And God said, Behold, I have graven you upon the palms of my hands. Thy gates are ever before me. God said, Every time I look at my hand, I will remember what I swore to Israel. And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget what I said. Amen? But not only that. The hand owns in it. You say, what does that apply to? Well, that's three times three times three. I like that number three. Amen. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these here are one. But let me tell you something else too. From the book of Matthew on to the book of Revelation. That is the new covenant. You have exactly 27 books in that covenant. And you have 27 bones in your hand. And when you see somebody in the Bible, they're doing a show of the blessing of the new covenant of grace. Where God said, I will forgive all of your sins. Amen. But, and not only that, it's a picture of Christ. Where's Christ at right now? Where is he right this second? The right hand of the right hand of God. He is God. He, listen to John chapter 1 verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father. Here's the hand. Watch this now. Here's the hand. The hand is Christ. Are you okay, Hunter? You're not going to make it, huh? The hand is Christ. Listen to me. It's in the bosom of the Father. Christ came down to this earth. And the, and the Bible says, here's, here's Moses' hand, and it's leprous as snow. Do you know what leprosy was a picture of in the Bible? What was it? Sin. Uncleanness. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be what? White as snow. Here's Jesus. He comes down from the Father. And the Bible says that all of the sins of mankind were laid on Him. And He took the sins of you and I to the cross, nailed them to His cross, they're there forever. They're stuck there. They're gone. They'll never be put in remembrance ever again. Somebody say amen. Then, 
What did he do after he made the atonement for all the sins of mankind? He went back to the bosom of the Father. Moses, put your hand back in your bosom. But he's not done, is he? He's coming again. And when he comes again, he's bringing his tools with him. He's going to build a house. Lynn, he's going to give you a new arm. Amen. He's going to give me new hips and new back, new nerves. And, and more hair, hopefully. Amen. A little bit dark. But he's going to build a new house. And he swore that the glory of that latter house would be far greater than the first one. So Jesus comes back the second time. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. Unto sal Pulls the hand out of his bosom the second time. There's no leprosy on it, is there? That's because when Jesus comes again, he's coming without sin. Now you listen to me. If this message... Listen to me for a minute. If this message is for one person, I'm preaching it. Job chapter 8. One of Job's buddies who misguided him said one thing that was right. He said, Job, though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end shall greatly increase. Do you know what happened to Job? Turn in your Bible to Job chapter 42. I'm, I'm teaching you the ways of God. Last Sunday, I talked to you about rebuilding. And I left this out. I it wasn't ready for it or whatever, but I left it out. Not you that rebuilds. It's not you. Stop and think for a minute. What you built... Where is it? In? I don't know a lot about your story, but I know you showed up here one day and you said, I left everything behind. Everything that Ian did, he left down in Florida. Literally. He showed up with a backpack on his back. About, that was about it, wasn't it? The rain. And God made me feel sorry for him. Roy, where's everything you built? I know where it is. It's in, it's in that body. It's in poured it out for you. It's gone. But look at what God has built for you. Look at what God has built in its place. Of course, there's going to be a and it's going to be a big mess. But I promise you, if you let God rebuild it, you'll stand in awe the rest of your life at what he did. Job 42, verse 12. Look in your Bible, and I'm going to let you. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than what? Now, do you believe what God said? I want you to look for a minute, for he had 14,000 sheep. Do you know how many sheep Job had before? 7,000. And they were all killed. 14,000 is twice 7,000, isn't it? And 6,000 camels. Do you know how many camels he used to have? Want to take a guess? 3,000. 6,000 is twice three. He had a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. Do you know how many he used to have? And 500. It's that simple, isn't it? God doubled for Job what he used to have. And Job was rich before. And God took every... Listen to me. You think about Job for a minute. God took every bit of his wealth and killed all of his children in one day. You think he had a reason to be bitter? You think he had a reason to sit down and say, I give up? Then, 
he was taking pieces of broken pottery, pot shards, and scraping the pus off of the sores that he had on his body in agony and misery, knowing that God did it. Do you think that he had a right and be bitter? Yes. But he refused. Now he wanted to die, and I get it. But he refused. And when God was all done, God gave him twice the amount that he had before. And the Bible says that he had seven sons and three daughters. And the Bible says that the daughters of Job were so beautiful that there wasn't a woman in the world like those three daughters. And Job favored those daughters so much that he actually gave his inheritance to them, not just the boys, but he tr like they were his sons. And he gave them his inheritance. And he had it to give. Now, you've got a choice. Be mad at God. Be mad at yourself. Or wait and hope glory of the latter house. Because I'm telling you, that's always how God does it. Every time. Who in here has been born at least once. Raise your hand. Who in here has been born twice? Isn't the second birth better than your first one? And it's going to last longer. Your first birth, the clock, and time is running out. Your second birth, is eternal in glory. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer, and I want you to ponder today what God has said to you. Okay? The altars are here. If you want to come and pray, you just go ahead. You just slip up here without just as I am, without one plea. I mean, I don't mind singing a song every now and then, but I don't think we have to. God's, God laid this on my heart this week. And I want, you to, I want you to think now. You can either be mad at God. You can either be bitter. You can either give up. Or you can wait for God to rebuild it. Father, I come before you. And I pray, dear Jesus, that you would bless these whose hearts are open, whose minds, dear God, you've been, you've been talking to, you've been dealing with, you've been showing them things. Before you today, God, they realize it's shattered, it's ruined, it's destroyed. Why, God, why did you do this? God, why did you make it this way? But God, you know what I've been through and you know what I've seen in my life. I've seen this, Lord. If I've seen it once, I've seen it a thousand. I've seen lives destroyed, wasted. I've seen lives shattered. Houses and homes and marriages and families, Lord, just busted up and destroyed. A whole nation, God, discarding your word. But Father, that's not the end. That's just the beginning. So, Father, we submit ourselves to you today in a brand new way. We ask, Heavenly Father, God, Lord, that you would just take our lives. Give us a token, Lord, of what you're going to do. So, Lord, give us an encouragement to hang on. And God, show us, God, that what you destroyed, you rebuild. That anything that we ever saw or ever thought, it will be better than what we prayed for. Because, God, your ways are right, and we know that, God. We get so stuck, Lord, we still want to hang on to the old. We want to try to piece it back together and make it work, God. And it's not, it's not right. That's not what it is. God, you have a far, far better. Show us what it is, Father. Lord, give us help from heaven today. Bless these, Lord, that call out to you, Lord, in honesty, sincerity, Lord. Young and old everywhere, God. We are not too old to serve you. Father, just bless your word today. and Bless this church. I thank you, God. 
the Spirit flow and letting the Spirit work and move in this place. Father, bless these lives this morning, we pray. We give them to you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Did you visit heaven today? Amen? Did you visit heaven today? Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to tell you how rotten I am. I was laying in my office earlier and I thought, I ain't coming to church tonight. I'm going to tell them I need a time, I need day off. And I got hell to preach tonight. So 4 o'clock, you be here because I'm going to preach hell. Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. God bless you. Johnny, lead us in prayer, please.